All right, it's Tuesday, April 16th, a little bit after six, and we welcome you to the annual meeting of the town of Sevastopol. Uh, first thing we'd like to do is introduce the town officers and then inter have you introduce yourself so we know who's all here. And why don't we start with, uh, what's your name? Um, my name is Amy Fluck. I am clerk treasurer for the town of Sebastopol and I live at 4818 County Road P. There we go. Mark Hain, town supervisor, 4675 Matthew Road. Jeannie Vogel, town supervisor, 4693 Windermere Drive. Dan Wolfel, town chair. Park Road. Linda White, Town Supervisor and fairly new resident at Cherry Hills Condominium, 4466 Fairway Lane. There we go. Trent Olson, Town Supervisor, 5856 okay. Timber Ridge Road. Okay, let's start. One of our presenters this evening. Mm -hmm. Just have you introduce yourself. Oh, it's Dick Weidman, Country View Road. There you go. Uh, Dale Vogel, I'm a county supervisor on the Bayside uh, and Windermere Road. Arlene Wolfel, Park Road. Hmm. Uh, Michael Zimmerman, State Highway 57, just down here. Cool. Keelan Moss video was certainly made by Park. Henry Parsons, Bridge Road. Chuck DeBerdy, and then on Route 57. Uh, Hugh Zetto, I'm the uh, District 14 County Supervisor on the quiet side of uh, Sebastopol, uh, Living Drive. Jackie Axel, 0.6 Bay Road. George Zacharyson, Blackport Trail. Bill Schuster, Living Drive. Here we go. Gene Elsie, Living Drive. Can't even see you, Gene. You're back there somewhere. <laughs> oh, okay. And our two videographers are? Uh, Derek and East Country Road. Road. Glenn. All right. Well, thank you and welcome all. Mm -hmm. The first order of business would be for us to give the oath of office to us to our newest board member, Trent Olson, and I will leave that up to the. Can we have Jeannie stand up as well? I also. Oh, that's right. My apologies. <laughs> yep. yep. That's right. You did win. I did win. All right. <laughs> so if you could stand up and raise your right hand. I am going to state your name. I Trent Katie Olson. Vogel. Having been elected to town board supervisor. Having, having been, been elected, elected to town, town board supervisor. supervisor. Swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Swear, Swear that I will support, support the Constitution, Constitution of the United States. States. And, and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And will faithfully and impartially. And will faithfully and impartially. impartially discharge duties of said office. Discharge duties of said office. To the best of my ability. To the best, to the best of my ability. ability. So help me God. So, so help me God. God. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. We always appreciate people who want to step up. All right. All right, at an annual town meeting, it's also possible for electors from the floor to make a motion. For example, we're going to review, not really review, but we have the annual meeting minutes from Tuesday, April 18th, 2023. Um, you will find if you peruse them that we're going to talk about some of the same things a year later hopefully with a little bit better update. But uh, we would need a motion to approve the annual meeting minutes from April 18th. You can make it from the floor, and if not, someone on the board will. I'll make that motion, Chair. All right, we have a motion from Laddie and a second I'll from second. second from Dale. Anyone have any questions relative to the annual minutes? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Jeannie? No, she's back there somewhere, <laughs> it's okay. All right, thank you. All right, uh, we're going to have a number of sp special reports tonight. We're going to start off with a presentation and review of our 2023 audited financial results. Elizabeth introduced herself earlier, and she will take us through that. And by the way, this evening, if someone would like to speak, we're going to ask you to step up and use the podium so that we can hear what's being said, and it also can come across on the video. So, all right, Elizabeth, thank you. Please go. All right. Well, thank you everybody for having me uh, here tonight at the meeting. Um, 
the good news is that there's really not too much that has changed since previous year. Um, the whole goal of our audit is to provide an opinion on the financial statements. That is the report that is on page one of those financial statements. Um, and I'm here to say that we provided an unmodified opinion, which means that the financial statements are materially correct. It doesn't mean that we're going to find, um, you know, every error that could potentially be in here. There's going to be things that are $20, $100, $500, $1,000. But we use a risk-based approach throughout our audit. Um, there's formulas that we use to aid us to determine what those calculations should be. And so I'm standing here today saying that, um, you know, the financial statements are materially correct. Um, if there had been any changes in accounting principles or any changes in the accounting policies for the town, those would have been listed in the opinion as well to call the attention to those. It was a pretty quiet year. Um, there was a standard that could have been applicable. It was called GASB 96. You may have heard grumblings about it. Um, it's not the funnest standard to work through. It did not end up being applicable to the town. Um, but just briefly what that is in case it does impact you in future years if you enter into a software agreement where you have the right to use that software over a period of you know three years five years ten years um, there is the uh, it's now required to be recorded in your financial statements whereas in the past it that was never a requirement so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind that's something that we'll always look for for the audit um, it's something that has impacted some places but as I said it did not impact the town this year so pretty pretty routine year skipping ahead to page six um, when the financial statements are issued there are essentially two sets of financial statements in here these this is just how the standards are written um, in relation to governments so page six is known as the government-wide um, statements this is where you're going to see all long-term items in here so the town's participation participation in the Wisconsin retirement system. That's something um, the state of Wisconsin is unique, I would say, in the fact that it's a fully funded plan. Depending on how investment returns do, it's sometimes a slightly overfunded plan, sometimes a slightly underfunded plan. That's nothing of the town's doing. It's all administered at the state level. Um, but if you're looking at page six, and if you're just kind of comparing last year to this year, you'll see up at the top of the page um, in the assets section, there's a line called the net pension asset. In 2022, there was a balance of 27,000, and this year it's zero. Well, that's because of the way the market fell this year. It was an asset last year. It went to a slight liability this year. This does not mean that the town is on the hook for this money. If the plan were to completely crumble um, and they had to pay out this benefit now, that's the amount of money down in the liability section, the net pension liability, um, that just shy of 18 grand there. But that's just something that's a requirement based on the accounting standards to be recorded. Um, that's not necessarily, you know, a liability to the town that you owe tomorrow or anything like that. Um, this schedule also shows your long-term obligations, so the, the state trust fund loan that the town took out a few years ago, um, that's being paid down every year. So the, this statement will show those long-term items. Um, th this is a, a service that we do for the town um, to convert your financial statements into this manner, but I'll be very honest, they are not used for too much in the grand scheme of things. So just know that they exist, but really the decisions don't really get made from the schedule. Um, the what I'll say is the more important version of statements start on page eight. These are known as the fund financials. Um, so one thing that I'll point out on page eight, you can see down in the liability section, there is the line for what's called the unearned revenues ARPA. That's that American Rescue Plan Act money. Um, it's a little bit unique uh, in the fact that you don't actually recognize the revenue until you incur the expenditures. Um, that there's that matching component there. So that those ARPA revenues as the town is determining what they're going to spend them on, they sit in that 
a balance sheet account as an unearned revenue. When the town does finally make their decision, they'll move off the balance sheet and into a revenue offset <coughs> against the, the expenses and the net impact on your income statement is essentially zero. So I know that that's been you know a hot topic amongst many municipalities and just know that that's where those sit. We monitor those as the town is working through those decisions and we'll make sure that you're matching up those revenues and expenses in the year that you determine um, you know what they're going to be spent on and we moved that at the meeting last night to road construction so that would Perfect. A substantial change. Yes, so. perfect. Okay. Yep. So that'll get recognized on your income statement in 2024 against those road um, expenditures. We'll take a look at that during next year's audit as okay. well. So perfect. Okay, down in the bottom section of this, I'll touch on this more later, but I just want to make sure I point this out. These are the ending fund balance categories. It's a little bit unique to governments that, you know, there's the rainy day funds, there's assigned funds, committed funds. These all have different purposes, and I'll go into those in a little bit. Um, but just wanted to point out, and, and we'll come back to those. Page 10 is the overall income statement for the town. Um, so overall, there's more details in the back, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. But the town did end up having, you know, a little bit more in expenditures than what they took in in revenues. I think that the town has really, really work to watch what their future plans are. Um, so as I'll talk on that topic a little bit more later, um, no concerns there, but they did end up using a little bit of the reserves um, from previous years. Page 12, this is the start of, um, you know, what uh, gives you a little bit of information as to what happened compared to the budget for the town over the year. You can see up in the top section, the revenues were almost, or about 190 grand higher than what they bu budgeted. You always want to budget conservatively, right? And you're able to add a lot more in revenues than, than what you're anticipating. So that's a positive sign to the town. Um, in the expenditures section, the town only went over the expenditures compared to what they budgeted by about $54,000. So that was a great way to control those costs. We see, and I know that we've talked in many years, snow plowing is a quick one that, you know, you get a really bad storm, the overtime from that, depending on how those fall, it can significantly impact those uh, expenditures. So the town did a really good job in keeping those under control, and then also the revenues obviously very much surpass uh, what the excess expenditures were. All right. Um, I won't get into too many details in the notes. Um, if you read through it, it kind of goes over all of the accounting uh, policies in place for the town, the application of them throughout. Skipping ahead to page 26, this is the capital asset footnote. This links to the government-wide schedule, that first set of financial statements. You can see that usually the town is doing some types of road projects, making improvements to the road. There's usually a few hundred thousand dollars worth of an investment put into those roads. So that schedule on page 26 is showing what that investment was um, in the town roads through the year. And there's other things that I know typically the town has some capital items that you know they just might not rise to levels that they end up on the schedule or based on their nature um, they might not end up in here so it's not a, a perfect science necessarily um, if an individual asset item is under the threshold it wouldn't get recorded um, so infrastructure is the big one that does end up being recorded year to year page 27 shows the long-term debt obligations Again, that would link to the government-wide schedule. Uh, town continues to pay down uh, the debt state trust fund loan from a few years ago. No issued debt obligations in this next year, uh, or for 2023, I should say. Um, for on page 2028, uh, this is always a footnote that is of interest because obviously the state of Wisconsin limits the amount of debt that a municipality can take out. The town of Sevastopol is in a unique position that you guys have a ton of room in your debt limit. <laughs> so there, it, technically if the town wanted to, you could take out you know, $57.5 million worth of debt for a large project that you and, have and going the on. And the lynching would begin like right after. Yes. <laughs> I, I, the 
of phone calls, you might just want to cut your phone line <laughs> if that were to happen. I don't recommend that. Um, but obviously, that's a good um, key to keep in your back pocket if there's ever that point that you know that large project comes upon you, um, that development. You never know what's going to happen. And we have seen municipalities work through those items. We do see municipalities that are on the opposite end, where they are reaching that capacity, and they don't know what to do. So I mean, you guys are the spectrum. Um, it's not too often that uh, you have that much wiggle room. I think this is the only board meeting that I joke about how much debt limit you have. <laughs> so, Okay, so skipping ahead to page 35, I mentioned those fund balance, those rainy day funds, your assignments, commitments, um, non-spendable. Those are in more detail on this schedule right here. So the restricted fund balance, that's um, pretty straightforward. It's restricted by you know, outside donor contributions. It's restricted by outside individuals to be used for that purpose. The committed fund balance, um, committed, what that means is that it's done by town board action. So when the town is taking an active role in planning for those future costs, you have the ability to set aside some of the revenues that you're taking in year over year in order to pay for future costs. Those sit into that committed fund balance range. As part of the audit, we take a look at what was your beginning balance, what did you put in there in your current year for revenues, um, what did you spend spend, making sure that you're spending things that you should be, right? And then what's that ending balance and that's what gets reported into this schedule. Um, I know that just for an example, I think the town had about 120 grand for the revaluation and that occurred, I want to say it was about 70, 75 grand that was spent on that. So you can see that revaluation account went down to that current value this year. That is a perfect um, example of how that committed fund balance is used year to year and you know the town's active monitoring is a positive sign as to being able to manage those costs in future years when sometimes those unexpected costs ha happen. Um, the beautiful thing about committed fund balance is that you can put things in, you can take things out of it as well. So if a project popped up that you're like, whoa, we really got to look at this, maybe you know broadband was an item in there, maybe that drops off and that gets used for something else. So that can all be done through um, town board action um, and we monitor that through the audit. On the top of page 36, Assigned fund balance, um, what this category is, is that if the town knows that, so we're, we audited 2023, town was obviously working on preparing their 2024 budget, they plan to use some of those funds that are carrying over from 2023 in 2024. We assign, or we don't, but the town ends up assigning that fund balance that will be used in the 2024. So that when you're looking at your picture of what 2023 happened, um, you can get an adequate view of what's left over, right? And that's what's in that um, disclosure right below the assigned of the minimum general fund balance policy. So the reserves um, in the unassigned we're just shy of 30 grand. Normally, we recommend, or the town has the policy of about 15%. So the town was a little bit shy of where they should be, but I think they have a very healthy fund balance in the committed fund balance, which again, that can be you know undone by town action if needed. And then also, within the assigned fund balance, Part of that is the use of ARPA funds. And so right now that assigned is kind of showing like it's um, being pulled out of your reserves, but really it's the use of those ARPA funds and it drew your unassigned fund balance lower. So what does that all mean? That's a lot of accounting talk, right? Um, the town, although they dipped low this year, if I were to do that calculation as it stands today, it would be completely different and I feel like the, it, the ARPA funds being recognized in there is just gonna boost your unassigned fund balance because you were really setting aside funds that you had already. So if that makes sense or any questions on that. No. All right, skipping ahead to page 41. I'll just highlight a couple of the, this is the much more detailed version of the income statement. So this will also match the front, but this is really what um, you know people can relate to when you're seeing um, day to day. You can see up in the taxes section at the top of page 41, the room taxes continued to be much higher um, than what was budgeted. I think that's been a yearly trend and hopefully it'll continue to grow that way, right? 
Uh, down in the middle of the page, uh, building licenses and permits, those continue to be higher than budgeted for revenues. Um, and down in the miscellaneous category, interest on investments, it was, I mean, we're seeing it across the state of Wisconsin. There's places that are just earning interest hand over foot right now. So that's positive little boost to the town. Um, and keep that up. I know that you guys are invested in LGIP. That continues to be a really, really strong one. So positive news for the town. On page 42, um, I mentioned earlier that that reval occurred during 2023. You can see in the general government category, there's the assessor line, um, and that's where that, that money was spent to that had been set aside in previous years. Um, down in public works, snow remo removal went a little over budget, but as we said before, that's one of those items that can quickly go over depending on when the snow flies. All right, skipping ahead to page 47, one of the indicators of how well an audit went is when you get to the findings for the year. Um, one thing that I always encourage um, boards and, and communities to do is to compare what were last year's findings and what were this year's findings because those changes indicate are things getting better or are they getting worse. So there were actually three findings last year when there are only two this year. So that's a great indication for this town. Um, the first one is segregation of duties for the clerk treasurer position. You guys are never gonna get away from that unless you hire somebody <laughs> it's just not worth it. Um, we take a, a hard look at that, those types of items. If we were to come across any fraudulent activity or anything that we felt was you know, essentially very risky, we would bring it to your attention and recommend some type of changes. So um, we think, you know, Amy does an excellent job. She's very transparent in everything that she's giving to us for the audit. She asks us questions as needed. So, um, you know, doing a great job and that finding is just something that you won't be able to get rid of, so. Um, page 48, preparation of the annual financial report. It's because we prepare it on behalf of the town. The amount of training um, and work that it takes, knowing all the disclosures and what can change, it's just not worth it with, from a cost benefit analysis. So, and then the third finding that was in last year's and is no longer in this year's was a material adjustments to the financial statements. So I believe if my memory serves me right, it had to do with when the ARPA is recognized. It's a little bit of a unique situation like I explained earlier. Um, so because we assisted with that, it ended up in a material change to the financial statements. This year we didn't have any changes. You know, we tweaked thing, little things here or there, but really the financial statements were in a pretty good, or the accounts were in a good spot when we uh, started the audit. It. Um, so I always like to say, what does that mean? When you know, you're given financial information at a board level, that means that you're getting, usually you're getting accurate, pretty accurate information throughout the year in which to um, you know, make decisions. We might be tweaking some things at the end of the year, making sure that something's you know, recognized correctly, but that's really a good indicator of how many adjustments are happening because otherwise you guys could be making decisions on incorrect data at that point. So so that's a really good um, point that I want to make is that that finding is removed uh, between last year and this year. So. All right, and then you guys do have the management letter, um, and if you would like to read through that, um, by all means, I won't go into anything because there's really nothing new. Normally, if there was um, anything major, I would go into that, but there is nothing. <laughs> so I'll kind of skip over that for this year. So are there any questions that I can answer? Anyone on the, in the meeting tonight that has a question on anything that's on there? Dick, you must have. I was overwhelmed. Oh, <laughs> that is excellent news, Elizabeth, on all counts. All right, any from board? I just, <clears throat> the only question I have is, <clears throat> what exactly are we doing that we are so far ahead on our, uh, that 53 million that we can borrow? Like, what specific things? I mean, it's awesome. But it's, what a is it's a calculation based on our assessed equalized, equalized, equalized value. value. Yeah. Uh, and so you can I mean, borrow up to part, that. But like, what are we doing? Specifically? We're not really doing anything. The delta between <laughs> what we spend and that ratio is what gives us the amount. Mm -hmm. So we could borrow. I would love to borrow fifty-seven million. Um, but it's, it's really not anything that we're doing. Yeah. I think that's. And with the equalized 
going changing up, going up next next year. Year. Be, uh, we yeah. might be able to borrow 60 million, yes. million. or more yeah. yeah yeah and I think that you know there's places it depends on what's going on in a municipality that really drives that because you know some places will bond for five million dollars in order to gain that development that's coming up so if you've got that you know you're gonna have to bond for it because there's not too many places that have the cash funds in order to pay for those items so it's all dependent on what's happening um, I think the town is also I know that like when this building was built you guys had a debt issuance I think that was paid off at one of the meet or right around the time um, so you know monitoring where your cash is at what you've got coming up in terms of projects are you gonna have the cash on hand do you have to think about going out for a bond issuance those are all the questions that if you're keeping up on those types of items it allows you to you know not take out debt if you don't have to not incur the interest that you don't have to and I think that the town has been very mindful of that in the last years um, you know with always hoping for growth right yeah more tax dollars Dick Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any other things? Mm -hmm. no. All right. I guess we're completed. Thank you very much for thank making the trip thanks, tonight. Yes, you. No problem. And thank, thank you all. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you for going Great through job. that with us last week as well. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Reverting back to our agenda, the next item on our agenda this evening is Kaylin Montevideo, who's going to do the annual fire report. As you well know, the Sturgeon Bay Fire Department provides our fire coverage, and we will give her the opportunity to share all of those things, especially that painted truck. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have changed the picture on there, I think. There you go. No, I'm joking. Um, good evening. So, uh, Kaylin Montevideo, um, I'll say later in the report, um, Chief Tim Dittman has retired. Um, Effectively, April 5th was his um, uh, retirement date, but hasn't been um, with the department since February. Took some leave um, up until his retirement. So uh, I was appointed as the interim fire chief while the Police and Fire Commission is um, deciding what the process is going to be for filling that position. So um, I prepared the annual fire report for you, as I have done in the past. Yes, we have a new truck on the front page. Um, we took delivery of that truck, I believe, in October, sometime this fall, October, November, maybe, maybe November. Uh, it is a brush truck. Uh, it allows us to do some technical rescue as well. Um, the nice thing about it is uh, if you can see on the front bumper of this truck, you see some kind of little pockets that we're able to slide our bipod system into it. So one of our big concerns for rescue is in the town of Sevastopol, Cave Point. We do multiple rescues at Cave Point. Um, we're hoping that this truck will allow us to um, get up over that edge with a, um, uh, a high point that's uh, secured and not having to tie off to trees that maybe aren't um, a secure source for, for uh, anchor point. So, um, in fact, our guys were out there this morning doing some um, training. Uh, our other two shifts will be out there in the next couple weeks. So, anybody gets a call that there's a bunch of people maybe going down the cliffs. It's our guys. <laughs> so um, I'll just run through the, the annual report. Uh, not a lot of different how we set up our annual report. Might look a little different than other years, but if you have any questions, please let me know. We always add our mission statement and our statement of values because um, we feel very strongly about that. We have not moved in the city. Our two stations on the east side and the west side have remained the same. Um, no updates to that. Um, our personnel, uh, last year in April, May-ish, we did add a part-time admin assistant. So she works um, 20 hours a week just to help with um, general office um, duties. Our full-time staff has not changed. Um, we still have our part-time fire inspector. We lost a few um, part-time staff last year. We ended this, the 2023 three part-time firefighters short. We are still three part-time firefighters short. So anybody knows anybody, please send them my way. Um, our apparatus, uh, with the addition of Brush 716, um, that's the one that you see on the uh, front cover of the report. Um, Brush 717 snuck its way into this report. That was an oversight on my um, thing. It looks like it was put in there twice. We did get a new brush truck, 717 as well. That was not put into service until 2024. So we have two brush trucks that um, 
are virtually identical um, with the exception of brush 717 is a, uh, a crew cab, so a four-man cab versus the two-man cab that you see on that front page. Uh, the other, um, I'm not quite sure if last year we had the Coast Guard boom trailer. Uh, we found a deficiency in pretty much the county um, with some containment boom that really nobody had it um, in the county. So the Coast Guard said, well, we have it. We aren't going to use it, and you guys can have it. Um, and we'll keep it up to date. We'll give you all of the stuff for it. So we do house that um, Coast Guard boom trailer with, I think there's 800 feet of, of containment boom in there. So um, the next page, which you're probably interested in, is our incidents for 2023. We ran a total of 1,817 incidents last year. Uh, for the town of Sevastopol, we ran 87. Of those 87, uh, 75 were, we categorize them as fire calls, but that would be any fire or service call. So alarms, car accidents, um, service calls um, get categorized under a fire call. And we also ran 12 um, EMR or EMS calls to assist the paramedics. So that happens when they have, you know, possibly a lift assist that they just need an extra hand for. Um, they have uh, EMRs that, uh, Sevastopol has their own EMRs, <coughs> EMRs that don't respond because uh, there's nobody available and they just need an extra hand. Surgeon Bay Fire um, assists with that. So on page seven, you will see our incident types. So by um, jurisdiction, so you can look the 87 calls in the town of Sebastopol. The, the um, type is a little small, so I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, we did, yeah, like I said, 87 calls in the town of Sebastopol, and you can see what those types of calls were. So um, kind of a whole gamut of, of calls. There's not one thing that, that is like, oh, that's what we need to work on for prevention. Um, probably our, our vehicle accidents and our um, alarms, false alarm calls, fire detector, uh, or your smoke detectors going off, CO calls, some, something like that. Um, on the next two pages is our, um, so page eight and nine is our five and 10 year um, incident comparison. So we always try to say, okay, what is our trend of, of our fire calls? Are we trending up in fire calls? Are we trending up in EMS calls? We know in the city and the town of Sturgeon Bay, we're turning up in EMS calls. They're, we're just getting a lot more EMS calls. Um, town is faster because we're not your EMR provider. We don't see those trending up. Um, so on the top of page eight and the top of page nines are the, probably the two um, graphs that you're going to be most interested in. So we see a trend overall in our response um, for incidents. Um, on the top of page nine, with the exception of 2022, which I can't explain, um, we had quite a dip in, in incident response, but as of 2023, we're um, sneaking back up there to our, our average or our normal. So I don't know why 2022 was a um, good year for incidents um, for the town of Sevastopol, but like I said, last year we were creeping back up. And then we always try to forecast, okay, where are we gonna be in the next five, six years? Um, and that's what you'll see on page 10 is our, our forecast of incidents. So, you know, by 2028, we're expecting, you know, over 2,300 calls. And we have kind of seen that trend that, that our call volume is going up. And then um, page 11, we're just talking a bit about our agency overview. So the things that, that we do as a fire department. Um, we always say we're firefighters, but that's probably the least amount of <laughs> things that we do in our job. Uh, it seems like when somebody doesn't know who to call, they call the fire department because we typically can solve the problem that they're having. Um, technical rescues, water rescues, we know we're a huge recreational um, community, so water rescues, um, drone operations, uh, a lot of specialty um, things that are being added to our, our fire service that many of us did not start with um, with our career. Um, and then page 12 and 13 is just uh, some more station activities, uh, uh, listing our equipment maintenance, um, some of the administrative things that go on, fire prevention. Um, and then on the right-hand side of page 12 is our inspection breakdown. Uh, so in the town of Sevastopol, we conducted 136 uh, regular inspections. So that's part of our 2% our dues that uh, you guys report back to the state. 
and then 15 reinspections um, for a total of almost 115 hours. Our training hours are outlined on page 13, so just kind of an overview of some of the specialized uh, training um, that we do with our staff. And some, we added some fun pictures this year too, because who doesn't like to look at some fun pictures, right? Um, and then on the back page is our, our uh, public education, fire safety um, report, um, going to the schools, so we're at Sebastopol School doing um, fire prevention programs uh, for all the um, elementary kids up to fifth grade, and then just some other community-based um, public education that we do. What is the photo on the bottom of 13? Was this a burial? <laughs> I mean, it's... Um, so the, the photo on the bottom of uh, page 13 is actually one of our specialized rescue trainings uh, for trench rescue. So we run in May, so coming up in a couple weeks, we run a three-day technical rescue training um, with some instructors out of the Valley, one instructor from Appleton, one from Oshkosh, and we do a, a three-day uh, technical rescue um, refresher. One day we do trench rescue, one day we do confined space, and the next we do uh, typically high-angle <laughs> rope rescue. So uh, this, is, this picture was taken out at our training site, so out by the, by the um, dog park in Sturgeon Bay, we have a, see those Connex boxes that are all stacked up, that's our, our fire department training site, it allows us to do live fire burns. Um, uh, DPW comes out and digs a trench for us, something different every year um, to, to allow our guys to do some, some trench rescue. I do have one question. Okay. On page 10, for your incident forecast, yes. and obviously it continues to grow and you project it to grow, at what point in time do you, does the rubber meet the road where you're out of firefighters given the number of incidents? <laughs> obviously you have some projection within that. Um, that's a great question. Sorry, I asked. So we have broached the topic in the city about at what point do our services outweigh our staff, meaning everybody knows growth is happening. Growth is happening in the town, not so much in the town of Sturgeon Bay, the town of Sebastopol, growth is happening in the city tremendously. So that's more calls for service for our, our um, firefighters. Where does that go? Of course, everybody's budget is tight. Where, where do we, how do we mitigate the extra calls for service and the extra demands on our fire department um, with the same amount of staff? Um, other than adding um, Brenda, our, our admin assistant, last year as a half-time, we added our, um, our part-time um, fire inspector in 2020-ish. Um, he works 24 hours a week to help alleviate some of the um, inspections that we have to do so every building that goes up that's two more inspections a year that we have to do so you can imagine how how quickly that that can add up um, but but beyond those two part-time positions I don't know that we've added any positions in 10 plus years probably 15 that's years what I was maybe? Gonna ask. Yeah. yeah so that's a conversation that I think needs to be had um, through the city, but it hasn't gone too far yet, so. And you've added responsibilities because now you're probably more of a backup to Bug or Nassawapi than you were in the past, or maybe not, but uh, um, I would guess. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say yes. I, I would say yes, county as a whole. Everybody is relying on their mutual aid right. because like us, <laughs> we're short three people. We rely on our part-time staff when our our um, on-duty guys leave the city or are tied up in the city, um, we call back because we can't leave, we can't leave the city unprotected or our jurisdiction, I, I can't say just the city, our jurisdiction unprotected. Um, so anytime that our, for instance, today we had a car accident on the highway um, at a pretty busy intersection. So both of our engines were tied up. Luckily one was able to cut loose pretty quickly. But at that point, if we know our staff is, our, our on-duty staff is, is tied up and can't leave for um, any reason, we're calling our, our, our part-time staff in to, to backfill to handle any additional calls that um, come in. For some reason, it seems that we're getting multiple calls 
at the same time, you know, the three, four calls that we're having a day aren't spread out over the 24 hours. They seem to be glommed into the one or two hours of, of, of the same calls. Um, and, and nationwide, the fire service is, is hurting, um, especially the volunteer and, and paid on call. I, I don't, nobody's really volunteer anymore, but the paid on call staff is, is dwindling. And the question is, where do we find people and where do we find dedicated people? Where do we find people that are available? So there are more jurisdictions throughout our county that are, are calling in mutual aid. Uh, we rely on mutual aid um, for the town, for, for insurance ratings. I'm sure many of you know that we have auto aid agreements with um, Hig Harbor and Jacksonport because of our unique county that we, we just can't we can't meet the requirements to give a good rating. Right. So it, it, it's difficult throughout the county. So the new fire chief is going to have to get some bodies. Yeah. That could be you. We're that could find, be. We're going to find get... some bodies. So if anybody knows anybody. <laughs> okay. And it's, right. it's, it's getting very difficult. So it's, it's a never ending. I, I will be with the department 25 years this summer. And uh, I believe we've been talking about recruitment and retention all of those 25 years of, of me being here. So it's it's an ongoing issue and nobody seem, can seem to solve the problem. So. It doesn't bode well for the communities that are primarily all volunteer and mm -hmm. yeah. there's not the staff there either. So right. at, at some point in time, it's gotta go to a county-wide fire just like we have with paramedics, but that's my opinion. So. Yeah, I think there's probably some discussions that need to be had to, to you know, combine some resources or, or, or solve, solve some issues that, yes. are, that are lingering um, throughout our county. Anyone else have any questions, Linda? Um, I'm really surprised at the number of medical assists. Are you required to send um, somebody from the fire department every time there is a medical assist? That's one question. And then I'm shocked at the number um, 12 in Sebastopol and 54 in the town of Sturgeon Bay. Mm. And then looking at your forecast, because it's no secret that we are an aging population, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm sure that number came into play anticipating more and more medical assists. Correct. So a uh, couple answers to a couple of your questions. Each town or municipality has an, an EMR or a first responder group. So first responders are now called EMRs. Mm -hmm. um, town of Sebastopol has their own EMR group. So that's why yours are so low on our report. In town of Sturgeon Bay, in their contract, we are their EMR group. So any medical call in the town of Sturgeon Bay, we respond to that. So Sebastopol had a lot more calls than that. I don't know how many you had. Um, we only responded to 12 of them. Um, in the city, we are the EMR group in the city. So anytime you call 911 in the city for an ambulance, you're getting um, our on-duty crew, um, one truck. Our EMR calls were up substantially this last year versus the year before. I think the year before, um, I'm going to say 25% of the calls were made by our EMR group, and they increased that, did some training, and I think last year basically almost doubled the number, which would have helped us. Um, same issues that you talked about, you know, they're not on the tractor, they can't jump off and answer a call and whatever, right. so. Right. Uh, At any rate, I was glad it was only 12. <clears throat> so. and, and next year's report, um, how we're reporting our EMR, excuse me, our EMR calls in the town of Sebastopol is gonna look different. So they're gonna actually be a governmental assist. Uh, I went to a, a, a training for ENFERS out at the National, National Fire Academy last year and how we were reporting it, uh, because we're not your EMR group, we shouldn't be reporting it as a medical assist. Uh, we should report, be reporting a little bit different way. So it'll show as a, a governmental assist or intergovernmental assist. Still and be the so it'll look same a little, a little effect, different. just a different it's, We're type. still going to be going, it's just going to look a little different on your, your right. incident type. So you might say, oh, you didn't respond to any medical calls next year. Well, we did. It's just categorized a little bit differently um, in our reporting software. Okay. Oh. Anyone? Yeah. Hugh, you got a question? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, I have 
I have three. Uh, the first is, um, and just for the record, up until today, I was on the Judicial and Public Safety Committee for the county, okay. which has EMS and the sheriffs, et cetera. And, and uh, we're looking at response times as the uh, county looks at investigating putting a facility between, EMS facility between Sturgeon Bay and Sister Bay. So I'm, I'm curious on a couple of things uh, because the county, up until you know we started pushing it there, haven't really looked at response times. They just looked at call volume. And so we're pushing them to look at response times to give us a better metric, because that's what our customers expect. How fast can you get there? So I'm curious is how do you define emergent versus non-emergent calls? And like, for example, is a fall non-emergent, or is a fall considered emergent? So I, response times to me are a very um, tricky thing to say, hey, we responded eight minutes for emergent. Because, again, Sevastopol, when we respond in the town of Sevastopol, we may be responding to um, over by uh, St. Joe's Mausoleum, right by Walmart anything. is the town of Sevastopol. We're going to get there in about two minutes. Now, if I, we have to go up to Cape Point, that's going to be, so it's, so average response time to me is, is a very tricky thing to, um, to talk about. So when you say, you know, if we have two calls throughout um, the month, we may, those two calls may be all the key points. So it might look like we had a 17 minute response time, but we only had maybe two calls because it was a long, a long haul, winter time. Um, so I always caution like on response times. Now when we talk about emergent versus non-emergent, our emergent and non-emergent response is determined by the officer that's responding. So if we get a call for, uh, Typic, not always. Typically, if we get a call um, for a fall, lift assist, no injury, that's typically going to be a non-emergent call because it's, it's um, maybe somebody just needs a little help up. Now, if we get a, a, a call that is uh, chest pain, that's going to be an emergent response. But we have left it up to our, um, this is just us, Sturgeon Bay Fire. We have left it up to our officer that's our officer on duty. I shouldn't say our officer on duty. Our officer that is responding to the incident on whether they respond emergent or non-emergent. They may respond non-emergent and we get information and they upgrade to an emergent response. So it, it, it really is all situational with the call. And it's all a little bit of an echo. No. Echo. And it, it, yes, yes. So in our recording echo. software, they have to document it's whether it's loud. emergent or non-emergent call. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my, my last one is, is actually relative to Cape right. Point. I asked them to. Which, which, contrary to rumor, Cape Point actually is in the town of Sebastopol. <laughs> yes. Um, mm -hmm. And finally got that. And the point. question is obviously, Jacksonport is closer. Yes, no, or is it because there are volunteer fire department <coughs> in, in the 17 minutes it, get, it takes to get your closest uh, unit there? Is that faster versus, say, a, a volunteer fire department? And, and, and does nine does a call center for the county automatically dispatch you because the, so that school is part of your, if you will, jurisdiction? So, um, so anything in the town of Sevastopol, we are going to be the, the responding agency. So any call within the town of Sevastopol, fire-related call, not EMR, um, we are the responding agency, so we will get alert. Okay. We... Um, are we going to respond faster than Jacksonport? Again, situational. They, they don't have a, um, uh, they may not have somebody that can respond. Um, so we may not get a response from them. But any, um, especially during, during um, water, summer, fall, water rescue, we rely on their boat. They have that, um, I call it the crazy legs boat, but the sea legs boat where they can drive, drive yep. the boat right in there. Uh, so we'll automatically <coughs> request uh, Jacksonport. So we do a we do a request through the comm center to page Jacksonport for their vote. So that's that's something that our guys are already are already doing. So they're responding as well. These times only reflect Sturgeon Bay's response. So Jacksonport would be doing another report saying that they gave us mutual aid. So what happens is when it gets uploaded into the the federal and first system, those two reports marry together somehow. Um, they get put together because we say we receive mutual aid from them and they say they gave it to us so the the, the reports kind of marry but as far as call times is just the, res the call time response from Sturgeon Bay but yeah we rely on them um, at Cape Point quite frequently so. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Anything else? I, I have a question. Okay. Oh. So a couple years ago, and I know that you're having uh, staffing issues, but I believe a few years ago with the annual report, you guys briefly mentioned that you were looking at possibly doing a third station somewhere kind of more north of the town just to kind of because of the expanding with, like, because you guys needed extra coverage. Is that still in the possibility or what's going on? I that, thought they mentioned that. That was a conversation I think that was had, you know, during a, a negotiation <coughs> of the contract and getting better ISO ratings, but yeah, I, we yeah. looked at one point in time in building a building where a I don't want to say an extra, but a fire truck could be placed in our community, but it would not be staffed. And the <laughs> idea behind it was is that there might be staff firefighters that live in our area that could respond quicker to pick up the hardware. And we pursued it with the school district and I talked to Chief Dittman about it and everything. And in the, in the end, it didn't pan out. The requirements for the equipment, the requirements for a cistern mm -hmm. uh, to hold the water, et cetera, et cetera, it just didn't work. So we dropped the whole thing and, and reverted back to what we have today, so. Well, I was just wondering because, I mean, if the county was also looking for that extra EMR station in the middle, and they're looking for around Jacksonport, Egg Harbor, northern Sebastopol area. I mean, is that maybe something we can kind of look into? To uh, I, I have to give that back to the county, I guess, and let them figure out where they're going to go. I don't know that a joint, I, I don't know, I'm not sure, but I don't know that a joint uh, fire station and another paramedic station in our community is feasible possible, staffable. I think the conversation that was had the <coughs> yesterday or the day before was that uh, even the paramedic station may not be manned fully, might only be manned partially during the summer months, during peak activity. So it might not, buy, even if it happened, it might not buy us anything. But I'd have to toss it back to that group, let them figure out where they think the response needs to be. So, we could borrow $57 million, though. We could buy our own, we could buy all of your employees and all of your equipment. I mean, don't get me wrong, I mean, like, they, the response time for you guys are great, and also the Sebastopol EMS, they're, like, almost instantly, anytime there's a call. But I also, we also hear the other reports where, like, more towards the southern part of Sebastopol, it's a slower time because there is no EMS coverage on there sometimes, with Sebastopol that is. And we have to rely on you guys more on that aspect. So I was just wondering if there was some happy medium that we could look into. I guess I will wait to hear back from the county and see what's up. Right now it's not on our plate, but that's not to say it couldn't, so, all right, anyone else? All right, Kaylin, thank you very much, we appreciate it, best of luck in securing the title permanently. Yes. We like working with people that understand the community for 25 years too, so, all right. So, uh, I'm going to take a few minutes and talk a little bit about some of the highlights in the town, and then from there we'll go into broadband and town park, etc. So, um, with that, I guess I first I'd like to say if you made it to the polls uh, for this last election, thank you. The the weather was anything but ideal, and I also have to thank those of you who voted for the woman on my right, Miss Vogel who has played a vital role in ensuring our ability to complete broadband expansion in our town. It would have been extremely difficult to bring someone new on board and say, oh, by the way, it's your project. Um, I know I would have run for the hills, but I'm very glad to have her back. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Also, last night I spent a couple minutes thanking Derek Daniel, who is no longer on our board, <clears throat> uh, for his four years of service. He was on our plant commission and park, parks department. And so we thank him for his years of service. And at the same time, we'd like to welcome Trent Olson, who's on my left. For, uh, he is the newest member of our board. And Trent follows in his father's footsteps. 
His dad, Tom Olson, was on the town board from 1996 to 2006. Um, I hate to say I was on that same board, and Linda was, was, the, there. was there as well, so two of us uh, knew Tom from that, so welcome, Trent. Thank you. Um, the couple, take a couple minutes now just to update you on a couple projects. The newest project right now in our town is the construction of a new restroom at the town park. And trust me, if you've never been in them, <clears throat> you could miss that opportunity. They sorely need upgrades. And we hope to achieve that this fall. Uh, we were very fortunate to receive two significant grants, one from the Raybrook Fund and the other one from the Door County, uh, Destination Door County Community Funds. Between those two organizations, they gave us $120,000, which is a significant contribution towards what is going to be a fairly pricey project. Uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank Amy, our town clerk, who was determined to garner some of those funds and did a lot of the grant writing, which is required to substantiate why we could use those investments. So thanks to her as well. High-speed broadband, uh, through the efforts of Jeannie Vogel and her committee, with a significant, and I say significant, contribution from Hugh, Hugh Zettel, who spent more than a, a ton of time. We were able to secure a grant for $816,000. If you attended any of our broadband meetings in the past, you know that our contribution to this seven-plus million dollar project was over $2 million. This will help greatly in reducing the amount that we have to pay for this capability throughout our town, which means it'll cost you less as well. And when we look at the analysis between what this service offers and what you're paying, in many cases with charter and other alternatives, you might actually come out ahead because the cost is so much less. So it could be a positive all the way around. This is a huge win for the town, getting these grant dollars and, and securing somebody reliably AT&T versus the bug tussle of the past. <clears throat> it eliminates the negative impacts that COVID brought for our school kids looking for internet access during those educational problems that they had during COVID. It brings high speed access for every person in our town. You may not subscribe to it, but it's gonna be at your door. Um, it also allows expansion for those people in, that might be seasonal residents that would like to become a permanent resident in our town but they needed access to high-speed internet to run their business from home. So we see that as being another positive in increasing the residency in our town. And lastly, it improves operational enhancements for all of our local businesses. Obviously, they're processing and ordering and everything else that they do. So overall, I think it's gonna be a great uh, positive impact on our community, and I look forward to the first time that they hook somebody up and we can go toast or something. Um, you're going to hear a little bit more from Jeannie on the AT&T implementation timeline, and Mark uh, will also talk about other park improvements uh, that we have uh, made and are making investments in. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the retirement of one of the founding members of our emergency medical, medical responders, the EMRs. Although the individual is not here tonight, Tim Flieger has decided to retire after 28 years. Why? I don't know. He could have made 30, he could have got the gold watch, but he has decided to uh, hang up his stethoscope, blood pressure monitor, whatever. Uh, he happened to be one of the founding mem members of our EMR EMRs in our town, and he has our undying gratitude. I'm sure he saved a lot of people's lives over those 28 years. So we have a small token of our appreciation for his service, and Amy will see that that he gets that in the next few days. So Tim, if you tune into this, thank you very much and enjoy retirement. <clears throat> okay, last item on my agenda, then I'll, then I'll be silent. I'd like to take a moment to discuss how to obtain accurate information regarding town business. I mention this because during the last election cycle, a simple land survey project that the town undertook to assess our property lines turned into a rumor that we were selling our beach access points along Glidden Drive and other areas. Nothing could be further from the truth. We also had some similar concerns come up with regards to property revaluations, rumors versus fact. So there are a few sources that I would encourage you to use to get the accurate information. Obviously, check our website. 
It's a great resource. It has, it's, it's almost like Fleet Fle Farm. If they don't have it, you don't need it. It's, it's on our website. Information on reval, broadband, per permits for building. I mean, you name it, it is out there. If you have a question, feel free to pick up the phone and call or email one of the supervisors or the chair. It makes no difference. That's what we're here to do, is to help in resolution and understanding. Of course, you can watch our monthly meetings, either on our public access channel, we're the only ones other than the city that have that, and we also have a YouTube channel, so if you like to just go forward, fast, hold, whatever, YouTube gives you some flexibility over the channel. You're welcome to attend our monthly meetings, annual meetings, budget hearings, whatever. Uh, all of our agendas are posted. If you'd like to get a copy of our agenda, all you have to do is call the clerk. She'll put you on a list, and for anything that comes up, you will be notified by email prior to that event. And lastly, I would say don't rely on social media. It's just <laughs> not accurate. So anyhow, that's it from, from uh, my perspective. So thank you for listening, and I'm going to have Jeannie talk a little bit about broadband. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the kind words. I get very emotional when I'm thinking about broadband because it will impact the lives of our community so much. So I'll try to keep it together. So um, as Chairman Wolfel stated, um, we did receive over $816,000 awarded to the AT&T Town of Sebastopol by the PSC, the Public Service Commission. Reading some of the comments made by the commissioners, it was very apparent that the letters of support received as part of the application made a positive impression, an amazingly positive impression, on the commission. Therefore, I would like to thank those that wrote those letters. The Sturgeon Bay Fire Department, Door County Economic Development Corporation, Do Good Door County, Door County Sheriff's Department, United Way of Door County, Destination Door County, School District of Sevastopol, Door County Medical Center, Clark Lake Advancement Association, the City of Door Administrator, Cherry Hills Resort, Pullich Farms, Shannon Claire Cabins, Jeff and Brenda Lang, Tom Dumnick, he's going to love me, he's my neighbor, Dumnicka, um, and I'll kill Dave and Lynn so, from Sunny Point, their name. So, Sajowski, uh, and Linda Laraway, sorry for killing that name. So it shows that you all truly make a difference, and I thank you again for writing those letters. So in early March, we had a kickoff meeting with a with 11-member team from AT&T. The team included people from the planning, engineering, <coughs> construction, project management, network sales and support. Laddie, if you'd put that um, up and a little bit more. Move up one more slide. There we go, right there. So I can share with you that the field work will begin in May and June. AT&T or one of their subcontractors will begin assessing poles for aerial implementation and areas where fiber may be buried. When these teams are in your area, they will leave some signage to identify themselves, as you see up on the screen. Their vehicles will also be easily identifiable. As displayed again, the, well, their vehicle's not on there, but again, make note of the display on the screen. So, and you can move forward with that. So in months going forward, you will see other signs of progress. Keep going, Laddie. Next slide, Laddie. He's working on it. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yes, and you can keep going. So you can give them a little peek of that and then keep going. So in months going forward, you'll see other signs of progress. With the goal <coughs> of connect connectivity in approximately 24 months. So I will provide updates on, on the monthly meetings that we have every month. And updates will also be posted on the Sevastopol website. Okay, and then you can move to the website um, and won't that be fun to see all that work oh yeah <laughs> and
and then to the website. So there's a website. It's att.com slash notify me. So I've already put my name on that uh, address bar at that website because I want to be notified when they're passing by my home. So I hope you will too. So in the future, in the upcoming months. There you go. There, yeah, there you go. Um, there'll be educational programming. Um, we're going to be working uh, with AT&T to set that up. I can't tell you exactly what that's going to look like right now, but it will be coming. Um, with the idea that instruction on how to use the internet and enabling you to cut the cable cord and get rid of that dish on your roof. So that's all I have. Cut the cord. <laughs> cut the cord. Questions from anyone? Yeah, questions? Yeah, Dick. There's a lot of existing conduit in the ground right now, and not by AT&T. So is there going to be a conflict with AT&T, or is AT&T going to be able to put their conduit next to the existing conduit? Well, AT&T, we're talking about poles. AT&T is an ILIC. That's a fancy name for saying that they have an agree, whatever their agreement is with Wisconsin Public Service, we energies, they have existing wire on the lines, right? They can wrap that with fiber without any permits, okay? So that is not a problem at all. That's gonna be about half of our community, about 50, roughly 50. right. Yeah, they're estimating 50-50, about 50% aerial, 50% buried. So we have existing at and aerial lines installed in fairly It should be, yes, I'm not an installer, but I would think it'd be relatively <laughs> the, easy. The, the issue that the other vendors have had is trying to get what they call make ready to get yeah. an assessment from Wisconsin Electric as to how much it's going to cost them to replace the pole, to get on a pole, to do certain things to hook up. And so that's undermined a lot of the efforts of some of the other people that are in the business. The good news with AT&T is, although half of it approximately is going to be above ground except to your house, it'll be below, uh, is they don't have those issues over the poles. So that makes their job easier and makes the implementation for us easier. Okay. In the other areas where it's necessary, they'll go underground. So, does that get at it? Yeah, I mean, it's just that okay. there have been you know, another company that has laid conduit throughout the town. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Charter Spectrum has a lot of multiple a lot conduits. of cables. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. right. All right. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you, Jean. You're welcome. And we'll keep up. Uh, next we have Mark Hain, who is the chair of the Parks Committee. Mark. Thank you, Dan. So <clears throat> this year we did mostly baseball field upgrades, updates. Um, last fall we started with skinning the baseball field, went back in time, back to an all dirt infield, which plays better, safer, makes everybody happier because it's easier to maintain. We get better hops, baseball players are happy. <clears throat> Parents are happy because they're not taking their kids for stitches. Um, we added <clears throat> bullpens on the baseball field, both sides for pitching. We would put fences down the lines, safety. School is always safety first, so we like to make them happy because they're our biggest, our biggest use of the field. Um, all three fields got the baseball and the two softball fields got new scoreboards that was uh, driven by the school and, and the town. Went worked together getting some um, donations. We got some small donations, and we get one anonymous donor came in and donated the baseball scoreboard himself. We got a, a little weird, um, in our opinion, name on top. It says, gift of a friend. We didn't, the town didn't get to do the wording. The school did that and was on the town park board. We kind of did one of these when we saw it. But if you go to the game and see that, that's, it's a gift of a friend. So that's from the anonymous donor. Um, if you go over there, they're, they're new di digital. They're Never, I'm not jumping up on ladders anymore and changing all the bulbs. It's pretty slick. Uh, high school is going to pitch count for the baseball players, so there's a pitch, pitch count right on there for each team. They're very nice. Red, white lettering, you can see it for miles. Very, very nice. 
Um, oh, there will be an eye-catching park bench, and Dan doesn't even know about this yet, installed at the Clark Lake Beach coming up. It was in memory of a lake resident who passed this winter, so that will be, be installed before Memorial Day. Um, it's, you've got to check it out. It's got a cool little saying on it. It's going to be pretty neat. Um, uh, the irrig irrigation control box for the three fields, the infields, was not accurate at all last year. I'd go in there and it'd be on a Tuesday and it'd be set for Friday. And it was coming on during ball games. It was all haywire, went all whack. So we're going to be replacing that this one this year with a new fangled, fancier, nicer, updated. Uh, when they turn the water on, irrigation will be going on hopefully the end of next week or a week after. Uh, I think that's about I, all I have. Oh, we are always looking for memorial trees. Um, the shade, we love the shade, we love the trees. Bring it on. Um, I believe Dick is still doing our... our no, no, I mean, you're doing our um, ash tree. Have you been doing that, or is that turned over? No, no I don't know if we haven't done it for two years. Okay, so that's what, that was my point. The ash trees that have died off. We'd love to replace them with uh, memorial trees, or if you just want to donate a tree, get a hold of me or Amy, and we'll take all you want to give us. Employee? Oh, uh, do you want me to talk about looking for one? R yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so <laughs> we'll, we'll take and we'll share a firefighter <laughs> with you. Yeah. <laughs> so this year we're trying, well, we're going to keep going forward. We're going to kind of split the duties over at the park. So we have kind of our field team and we have our <coughs> parks and grounds and all the other boat launches and, and cr that part crew. So we've hired one gentleman that's doing most of the groundskeeping on the fields as of now, but we'd really like to hire, it'd be nice to have a young baseball minded or softball minded, sports minded person to come in so we're looking for another employee. <coughs> it doesn't have to be a young person, but it'd be nice to be able to keep them for consecutive years. Any age can apply. Any age can apply. <laughs> All we can do is tell you no. I think they have to be at least 14. Well, 14, 14. yes. 14, 14 yes. yes. 14, yes. if you can stretch yourself up there. <coughs> Might be a little bit young for a firefighter, but we can, we can work through it. Any questions, Any questions? from Mars? What is the time frame on the um, restrooms? Yeah. Well, we're, are they fall? we're hoping fall. Okay. We're going we're gonna to have a meeting tomorrow night. Yeah. Start to break things okay, down. So it won't not start this season. Right. No. It will be after mm -hmm. the uh, fall Labor Day oh. and tournaments and before okay. snow, yeah, so we so don't have to pay up charges for things. But that, that's the rough okay. timeline. So, okay. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, next item on our agenda is called Vision for Future Needs and and or Projects. So, if there's something on your mind that you think that we should be taking a look at over the future, good time now to tell us what that might be. It's most of what we do here is driven by what you tell us. So, going back to the early days of the comprehensive plan, one of the key things that came up was internet connectivity, and it's taken us a few years, but we think we've achieved or will achieve that goal. But if there's something else in your mind, feel free to share that with us now or later. Anyone? I, I had an idea. Um, uh -oh. Should we have a generator? Just looking at the election. Now, the, all of the machines have battery backup, but I think they're only good for a few hours. They are only good for a few hours because but. the day of the public test, um, I had the machine plugged in um, the whole time before it. <clears throat> And then while I was doing the public test, I did not have it plugged in, and it was only good for maybe two hours. Yeah. So um, I did that day call Kale and Montevideo um, because we were preparing for the possible um, lack of power, and we did have a plan, a backup plan in case the um, power did go out. We were very happy that it wasn't the day after. Um, but we did have a backup plan in case it did go out. So um, it's possibly something that we would want to look at for um, a budgeted item maybe for 2025. Mm -hmm. right. I don't know what the cost of a generator is or how yeah, big of a generator, generator, um, generator. generator we would need. 
for the town hall to at least have <coughs> lights, heat, and the machines big. up and running. Big. <coughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be very big. It wouldn't have to be too big? No. But we have power in the TV room. And we have it by, that, by the ops machine, but that only... I know, um, maybe what we should look at is expanding the connectivity off of that because it's got more capacity than we are even touching. So but I mean, we can look at we can look at either boxes, you know, office 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 office. Office. right? And that power supply uh, can run. Uh, it, it's huge. So it's possible that we may need to reconfigure. We can take a look at that Absolutely. and see if we can do that. So. Well, that's even something too. Like you saw the other communities and churches and stuff, like Washington Island, for example, the church and the, the community center, they let people come in and warm up, take a shower. Obviously, we don't have a shower here, but if we do have a generator and it's long and people are out for quite a long time, it be a warm place to come and hang out. Okay. Anyone else? Anything? All right. Any electors' concerns from the floor? <coughs> or resolutions in written form from the floor. Hearing none. All right. So a few announcements. We touched on this a little bit last night. Because of the revaluation, <clears throat> well, every year we have an open book, but this year is probably a little more important that you understand that role that that plays in your assessment. We expect the assessments to come out from the appraiser in the August time frame. There will be an open book on September 8th from 11 to 4 p.m. And also there will be an opportunity for you to talk to an appraiser <clears throat> on Tuesday, excuse me, yes, on Tuesday, September 10th from 10 to 4. When you receive your assessment, there'll be a phone number and you can call and request a time to talk to the individual. Uh, they will set it up. Don't bother to call until you get your assessment. But when you do, if you <laughs> want to talk to someone, they will establish a time for you to do that, and or you're welcome to come to the open book. Either way, whatever is most effective for you. <clears throat> Should you not be elated with the results of that discussion, the Board of Review is scheduled for Thursday, September 26th from 1 to 3. And that's in person here at the Town Hall. All right. Any questions relative to you? Yeah, relative to the reval, when do they I think it's supposed to be done by month. April. Yeah. With the field work? Yeah. By yeah. the end of this month. End of this month, yeah. Okay. So, and they, they wait until, they don't send out the assessments until they get the final assessment done by the state of Wisconsin to make sure that their assessment and the state's assessment are somewhat in alignment. You know, the state could come back with a billion and they could have whatever, you know. So they're going to hold and that's the reason that you won't get the assessment docs until sometime in August. Okay. And one more question regarding uh, reval. One of the benefits, um, you know, we, we talk about earlier how the uh, equalized value increased and we kind of basically didn't have to do anything, right? It's, you know, property values and all that uh, in our properties and assets that we have in Safaspil have increased. Uh, and one of the things that broadband will do is we know nationally that property values increase roughly uh, 3% or more when you have fiber broadband available. Mm. So I think that's a question from a revaluation, you know, because that basically is a benefit to all the residents uh, and property parcel owners of Sevastopol. And so it'll be an uh, interesting question how the assessors will review that. Obviously, it's not been deployed yet. But it is something that is recognized. You know, we've heard from real estate agents, et cetera, about you know uh, property owners wanting to know: Do you have do you have broadband access? Do you have high-speed broadband? Do you have fiber? So we know that has a positive impact on on homeowner values. So I think that's you know something that is a benefit that we'll see um, uh, Supervisor Hain, you know, relative to other increased values because of some of the investments, like what the town is doing in broadband. Thank you. Good. Thank you much. All right, we're coming to that portion of the meeting that's usually everyone's favorite. It's called the adjourning of the meeting. Um, and we are going to. You can't. You can't do that yet. We're not ready. 
All right. <laughs> we have a motion by Laddie and a second by Derek to adjourn. And by the way, the date of our next meeting, we want to write this down, is April 15th, 2025. It's the third Tuesday next April. Don't miss it. All don't right, miss don't it. miss it. All right, we have a motion on the floor, and all of you can vote to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Good evening. See you at our next meeting.